you're watching the leadership forum what is the ideal kenya that you want kenya twitter kyle movement is on it was launched yesterday and of course also they're seeking views from kenyans on what the ideal kenya that they do want and I'm holding court this morning with Sam Mohochi, who is the executive director of ICJ, that is the International Co Commission of Jurists. Also, we do have with us Mary McQuindia. She's a leadership coach and also the CEO of CDI Africa. We do have with us as well George Kigoro, who is the ex executive director of Kenya Human Rights Commission, and John Gidongo, who is the executive director of Inu Inuka Trust. Right, let's just hear from you. We promised to circle back with you, John. Good morning and good, good morning. to see you as well. Kenya Thank Twitter Kayo. What is the ideal Kenya? Mary says this is not the first time that we've been here. What do you think uh, this particular movement now will bring as a substantial difference maybe to the th previous attempt? I, th I think one of, one of the things that makes Kenya special, uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not an advocate of Kenyan exceptionalism, but I think Kenya is unique in many ways. And I think one of the ways that Kenya is unique is, is the capacity of its citizens to organize themselves to bring about positive change um, in, the, in the way that they are governed. Whether it's about constitutional reform, whether it's about removing Section 2A, whether it's protesting various things we organize, whether it's through civil society, and then we had churches at the, at, the, at, at the forefront. In fact, this is not the first... This is not the first Kenya Twitter Kyle. Mm -hmm. We've had one before. And all the freedoms um, that, that we enjoy, the new constitution they enjoy, that we enjoy, the fact that Nation TV has a license that is able to invite us here is as a, as a result of these struggles, like Kenya Twitter Kyle, that comes now at an important time when we have a combination of factors, some of which my colleagues here have articulated very well. but. You know, we still have a corruption crisis uh, in this country, this time combined with an, <coughs> an austerity crisis um, where uh, you know, the poor are being forced to pay for the profligacy and corruption uh, of, of the elite. We have a political transition uh, come, you know, come, coming in. This is President Kenyatta's uh, last term constitutionally, the stroke of constitutional reform. So there is also a need to, to protect this constitution that took you know, many Kenya Twitakayos to bring us to this point. So it's not only about um, protecting the, the gains that we have uh, achieved so far, but taking us this next step at this rather fragile time, not only for Kenya, but for much of the world, which mm -hmm. is in a very fragile economic, uh, economic time. Right. Uh, George, so you're calling on Kenyans to rise and fight against impunity as well as claim political and economic freedom. First of all, before we even uh, launch here, uh, could we uh, maybe try and uh, highlight some of the high spots that we got from the pe previous uh, initiative as well? That can, can be a learning lesson and also maybe a guiding, a guiding post where we're headed with this particular initiative right now. I think <clears throat> the, the previous initiative was um, uh, the, the Kenya we want came about in the early 1990s. At, at, at that time, the big debate in the country was whether or not then there was need for constitutional reforms. Uh, the Kanu state uh, denied the need for constitutional reforms. Mm -hmm. So the Kenya Twitter organized uh, uh, to demonstrate that constitutional reforms were necessary and had their place at the time. And um, so the highlight of that uh, organization at the time was to, uh, to the, the creation of pamphlets in several local languages that explained a vision for the Kenya we want at that time. And the drafting in 1995 of a model constitution so the fact that a model constitution was created, it fired up imagination and said uh, it's, the kind, it, it's kind of moved the debate beyond whether or not constitutional reforms are necessary into the space of if we were to do constitutional reforms, what might the content of those reforms be? So the Kenya Twitter movement of that time is the one that uh, started the clamor for constitutional reforms that uh, were realized in 2010. It took a long time, but that is where it started in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. All uh, right. Mm -hmm. So, but but before that, uh, before the constitutional reforms, uh, a, a reform moment moment came in 1997, 
where uh, the, the, the reform forces were saying uh, no, no, no reforms, no elections. And that is what led to sort of these abridged uh, reforms uh, through the IPPG process of 1997, okay. getting rid of um, the Chiefs Authority Act, getting rid of sedition laws, uh, expanding the electoral uh, management body's composition to include participation by opposition uh, groups and uh, and so on and so forth. So that uh, so there was a small reform thing that occurred in 1997 as a result of those efforts, which then um, uh, was big enough to please the opposition to participate in the election. And then uh, because it wasn't uh, ultimately sufficient, the clamor continued after, after the 1997 election uh, and culminated in uh, the constitutional reform process that uh, uh, that that w that went on at Bomas uh, at a later point in time. Mm -hmm. oh, all right, uh, let's hear from uh, Sam Mohoche, <coughs> and uh, we we try and uh, try and to also uh, look deeply uh, because uh, we had Jerry Kabiri saying that uh, the talk, especially the talk on uh, the constitutional change and the referendum right now, uh, she says this may take us back to, uh, from where we came from. But should we go back to where we came from and try and see uh, where we lost it? Where did we lose a plot? Because right now everyone uh, in, in Kenya, or maybe this is uh, you know, the driving of uh, the politicians' uh, agenda as well as far as the referendum is concerned, and we're not seeing the, the bigger picture. I don't know what will be your ideal position on this uh, particular reforms that people now are clamoring for. You know, it's documented that our national memory is only 21 days. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And, and uh, the Kenya to Itakayo initiative is actually a mutation. It's been evolving since late last year. Mm -hmm. The reason why uh, we are now talking about handshake, which is not anchored in any law, is because of the manner in which we handled the election last year. And, uh, and, 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 and I tend to think that uh, we, we, we should always uh, recall, because it's, it's quite frustrating to many, many people that uh, we have to come in and say, okay, what is the position of the citizen? If you look at the citizen, uh, the, the, the charter that was launched yesterday, it is an affirmation by the citizens that we want to reassert our rights. We want our voices to be heard. That uniqueness is the difference. Let's hear out the citizens. We've met groupings, small, small, import, small scale importers, you know, Clearing and forwarding agents. You have people who have been evicted under very inhumane circumstances in Nairobi, Mombasa, and the state is just asserting and saying the state exists, so we have to do this. They don't care whether people will be rendered homeless. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Kenya has uh, been exposed to a lot of public debt. Are the citizens adequately involved? Now that we have this situation of uh, debt management, the state is going back to the citizens' pockets. Can the citizens' voices be heard? How do we want to proceed? Uh, you recall that uh, the Building Bridges, for example, initiative talked about uh, lifestyle audits. How are they being conducted? Who is doing it? Is it being done within the law? Is there a time frame? Do we expect results? These are the questions the citizens have to ask. When you see the mess created with importation of goods into the country, mm -hmm. the delays occasioned, that is stifling commerce. So you find there are very many sectors, different sectors that would wish for an ideal that does not exist. And they do not have the platform. So I think this provides an opportunity to involve citizenry in commenting and contributing in identifying the problem mm -hmm. as opposed to jumping the gun and saying let's rush to constitutional referendum we are internally trying to look at implementation of the constitution so far yes trying to identify what is the problem in implementation is it the law is it the people and how best that can be addressed and that is why we have not taken the position that we support referendum or we oppose and we tend to think that this has to be a much more in-depth, uh, consultative, and objective process. Right. Uh, Mary? 
I'm still not clear. Are there laws or are there not laws? Are there systems, are there complaint channels? Yes, it's important to inform the citizenry on the key issues that are required. But as you've said, if there is property being uh, taken over or there is importers not follow, not able to, to process, what are the current laws? What are the current uh, ways that we can address that issue? Are people following those channels of addressing those concerns, going to the courts, raising up the objectives according to the legal process that there are? If there are laws, then let it, let's follow them, let's implement them. Because honestly, in my view, is that there is a lot of complaining by ourselves by the citizenry, but what responsibility and ownership do we as citizens, either as business groups, as landowners, or whatever it is, to try and make sure that we follow that through? Mm -hmm. And that to me is my point. There's always in a functioning society going to be ills in a system. What is it that we're doing practically following the causes written out in law to try and address them? Mm -hmm. There's the overall in terms of visioning what can be done but the immediate thing is not to go to the overall visioning and saying we're going to change the whole structure is to go through the system and the processes that are there if you don't follow the processes and the systems that are there then are you saying that the law is not valid and is not going to be useful mm -hmm. and i'm telling from my point of view we're a functioning society yes. there are many ills but how do we positively address these functions as ourselves to make sure that they are done how do we increase open government? How do we increase accountability of the people that are there? Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of change, whether it's in to do with the, you know, Hudumia Wanainchi. If I look years ago, getting IDs, getting, you know, passports, filing your taxes, mm -hmm. by the time you're actually making institutions accountable for what is they're supposed to do, making them open that we can see what is happening, we're able to get them to be more accountable. What's happening at the registrar? of companies to ensure that there is data available and open to us you can google who is this company who are the directors then we can allow investigative journalism or ourselves to understand who owns what what is moving into that those are the systems we should be forcing and ensuring are working well we used to have this thing of putting in um, the what you've talked about the the um, the wealth reports yes i was there all of us used to write them what happens to those papers are they accessible? Are they digitized so that we can read who owns what and then we can audit their lifestyle? Those are the things to me that there's enough systems and structures that we should be pushing to be working as opposed to saying that we need to rejig the system or we need to do 100% audit and if it doesn't work then we start a new system. That's what we as citizens, for myself, I am tired. We politicize and are politicking from January to December five years in a row. When are we going to be building the nation? Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe we should also be, I think, on the, on the context of, uh, the context of uh, wealth declaration. Uh, because we know this particular exercise has been ongoing, and the, the government has been harping on it. But what are you as civil society, and I know uh, Mary, she is not really part of it, but you collectively as a, a civil society as well, what are you doing to put tails on this, some of these pronouncements that uh, we get from, uh, from the government or, or our political leaders who come out to the fore and say, yes, we shall start uh, a wealth declaration. We see there's so much drama and melodramatic uh, actions on it, then it tapers off. And no one actually is putting tails on it. John, the well, civil society has been fairly, I mean, it's uh, studiously silent on so many things. Even we wondered, uh, was the handshake extended also to the civil society as well? I don't think we've been silent, uh, uh, Debril. I, I think that, 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 that's unfair. We've been very, very clear uh, about some of these promises that have been made with regard to things like... Uh, the, the audits, uh, lifestyle audits. Uh, I think we even had uh, the suggestion made by the president with regard to the use of lie detector uh, machines on, on civil servants. And, uh, and the, the point that was made at the time is that, you know, for the last six years, um, this regime has been masterful at promising, uh, but under delivering massively on issues of accountability and anti-corruption. And that's something which we emphasize. So when the promises were made, again, you know, we said, OK, let's watch and see. <laughs> uh, we hope for the best. Uh, but we don't expect very much. Uh, the, the, the process of, of public officials um, 
having to uh, declare their assets and liabilities was something which has been there since 2004. Um, I, I, I think if you go to the Public Service Commission today, you should still find that all public officials above a certain rank uh, have to fill out their form every year. And there's a repository there. There was a space that was created that is there. And those uh, documents uh, are accessible via court order by people like the Anti-Corruption Commission and any other competent authority. So uh, that those systems exist. The information exists. What, what has been lacking, the disconnect, has been uh, the will to, to initiate the action, to say, okay, we're going to interrogate. This is Debril's um, uh, asset declaration over the last six years. This is Githongos over the last uh, six or seven years. And we're going to use it um, to, to ask, you know, how come he's uh, earning a salary of X, but is living uh, a lifestyle uh, that is very different from that. So what, what we've seen, um, Kenya doesn't lack in systems, in laws, in procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very good at them. Uh, we're very good at producing reports as well. Uh, you know, we, we have you know, people from uh, academics from developed countries coming to, to study our anti-corruption infrastructure here in terms of our legal regime because it's, it, it is so sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, what is unique here is that it, once we put it in place, we don't use it. It's mm -hmm. as if uh, you know, putting it on paper um, it means that it works. Once, once you once you put it down, once it exists, it has to be implemented. And sometimes, uh, you know, it has led, I believe, um, to a widespread, very fundamental skepticism, which is what you're feeling, uh, a skepticism that, uh, despite all the promises, uh, despite all the new initiatives that are, are being are being pronounced. But this is not really serious. This is something which will grab headlines. It's very, very interesting. It's very, you know, it gets a good headline that we're going to have uh, lifestyle audits, that we're going to do lie detectors for, for, for public officials. But, um, you know, as, as Sam said, 21 days later, it's gone, and people are back to complaining. And I think they complain with due cause, uh, because they say, hold on, we keep on being promised something. Where's the delivery? Uh, the machinery is in place, but it is not being used. Mm -hmm. And that is a deliberate political failure. Very deliberate. All right. Uh, yes. Well, maybe. maybe just a quick one on what John has said uh, on that issue that those um, declaration of assets have been there from the 2000, I remember, mm -hmm. and they are available. If civil society, you know, could push that those are made accessible online of anybody paid by public funds. Just as salaries should be declared on public funds for each and every position, mm -hmm. then that would be live available data. We had a case of a, of a governor supposed to be worth so many billions, he says that, and others. Yes. If we were able to have those and pushed for those to be available online, and we have the, also the what is going on at the Registrar General, that is, you know, gener uh, Registrar of Companies being yes. mm -hmm. publicized, then citizens in that particular area for themselves could search, what does my governor earn? What did he declare for the last three years? It's not time for election. You can actually see it. You can be able to have investigative journalists and others publishing reports of what people earn, what they did before. It is that sort of information that allows people, if it's there, to be able to make up their mind was this person corrupt or not? Was this organization corrupt? Just as I've said, things to do with all the audit reports of every single parasito and every single government department yes. should be available online for people to see. All procurement that you've had procurement, now I understand, is available online. Who are the vendors? Who are the winning bids? Let them be online. Let's have open government that you can be able to track. It is those mechanisms and systems that allow you. I, uh, I agree. And, and just, I just want to respond uh, to that because I think that it's something that has already been dealt with. Um, in, in, in 2004, when the system of asset declarations by public officials was implemented by the government at the time, civil society did push, led very much by Transparency International mm -hmm. Kenya, mm -hmm. for these to be made public. Yes. Because in Zambia, 
the, the asset declarations yeah. were actually published by civil society Excellent. every yeah. every year. Yeah. We said, if they can do it in Zambia, why don't we do it here? Absolutely. It was stopped in parliament. Yeah. Yeah? The, the MP said that it would be a big risk and they'll be kidnapped. and you know, the, a, lot, a lot of excuses <laughs> were made. Now, uh, so the, the push continued. The push was from Good. civil society. Good. The pushback came from, uh, from the political class. And I think that we've got to continue yes. that that, yeah. that that push. In terms of um, uh, with the, the earnings of public officials being published, uh, that is something that has been there uh, before. Again, 2003, 2004, uh, the the salaries. Of, of certain public officials. I know when I was a public official, my salary mm. was inside the government estimates. Very clearly, you know, exactly how much I was earning every month. And I think that, uh, I think we have, we, have, we have two things. I think it's very important to make it, to, to get this information online. We have an increasing number of, of agencies that are dedicated to also unpackaging this data and, and, and presenting it in a manner that one inch are yes, able to consume it. Yes. Because sometimes this information is available. I think it's either this uh, next Tuesday when the Auditor General is going to be presenting his reports again to, to Parliament. And, you know, one, one guarantee yeah. is that mm -hmm. we're going to find uh, quite a number of, uh, of scandals in there. And they'll take time um, mm -hmm. to, to unpack it. So building that capacity is important. Again, that's a role which I think Kenyan civil society has been able to play extremely well. You know, if you look at civil society right. across a region in engaging these issues. But when we talk about uh, the exercise of uh, wealth declaration, uh, could we say that also this is an exercise in futility? Because uh, there is a tripping wire also in the constitution that after all these people now they've declared their wealth and uh, they all, all the, the, the form itself actually is touched in, a, in an envelope and stored away. What is the rhyme or reason for me actually to declare my wealth and then this particular uh, document that I have, yeah, itemizing all my wealth is actually put in an envelope and stashed away because there is a law that says that particular uh, uh, document should be in an envelope and stocked away. So who knows what? And what is the rhyme and reason of having that particular law? I don't know what particular uh, uh, article of the constitution in this. Maybe the legal minds will help us here, uh, John Kigoro, to tell us. Uh, yeah, does it make any uh, leak of sense to have all this exercise, everyone declaring their wealth, then we have all that listed and put in an envelope. No one knows what is in the envelope. Uh, Diban, this, this debate about uh, wealth declaration, um, wealth declaration is a tool in the overall um, uh, set of infrastructure or mechanisms to uh, promote in integrity in public affairs. Uh, so it's just one of very many uh, things. Um, there are many other things that uh, that ought to be in place, but a system of uh, integrity in uh, in, 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 uh, in the management of public resources is founded on three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is political leadership. You've got to have clear political leadership that the country is moving in a particular direction. That there is no evident political leadership in the fight against corruption or in the promotion of, in, uh, of integrity. And we can give many examples that uh, communicate that idea. But that's the most important of the three uh, pillars. The second pillar is institutions, processes, and so on and so forth. So that is where the wealth declaration things come in, but it's not the only one. You've got to have um, uh, investigative agencies that work. You've got to have... Um, uh, uh, action on reports that are made and so on and so forth. There, you've got to have audits. Uh, so that 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 is the, the second pillar. The third pillar is you've got to have public support for the for 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 for, for, for integrity. That this is we are all committed to this way of of life, and uh, that. Uh, that is also not necessarily evident, and one of the ways in which public support for that uh, for, for, for that choice is undermined by the first pillar, political leadership. Because what happens with political leaders is they incite the public to have uh, to to prevaricate about whether or not. Uh, the fight against corruption is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this this whole idea, to so on and so forth. So those are uh, so the wealth declaration 
is a small strand mm. of a large pillar. Mm. Uh, but the most important pillar, which is political leadership, is itself absent. So we can talk about wealth declaration and say it is working, it is not working, but it isn't the only thing working and it is not the most important thing that is not working. That's a very huge general statement about political leadership not working. There are so many political leaders from 47 governors to MPs to the executive. I think through my career I've seen some changes. We move forward, we move back. In some aspects we get better, in some we get back. And I mean the issue of parliament itself, yes, as a political <coughs> leadership, them refusing for that issue to be published tells you what that political leadership in that circumstances are. But I think we've taken many steps forward, sometimes back. In some areas we are right up there and some areas we're not. So I think it's quite a mixed bag. It's a mixed you know, particularly from a, a private sector and personal. I mean, there are things we've seen completely change because of technology. Okay. We've seen what technology does mm -hmm. in e-citizenship, in IDs, getting IDs, the way Monenchi was frustrated, in getting passports, in getting a lot of documentation, in paying your taxes. KRA has certainly improved tremendously. There are still issues. But I think we made step changes. When we, I first went into government, I remember dealing with John in the first government of Kibaki and trying to clean up. There was really goodwill. I mean, we were talking about one organization where I was and we brought international companies and in other areas mm. to really clean up government. And there was such an enthusiasm and a move to claw back assets and deposits abroad. And I've seen some in this, you know, in the previous or current this regime, but we keep going back and going backwards. I like the way you put it in that there's that goodwill political leadership, then there's the systems and structures, then there's the, the people themselves really getting up and demanding um, accountability of their leaders and I'm hoping I see some of that happening at the county level because government is very near to them and they see that you, that is not taking place the citizenry then are saying we are tired they come in into the into the county government and saying we are going to have a service I think we've moved somewhat forward but still the political leadership as a huge whole of MPs, okay. MCs and, and, and mm. uh, others, th there are some areas we really do go backwards sometimes. Right. Let's hear from uh, Sam Hochi because I think uh, th that particular question about the witness as well, uh, or wealth declaration, uh, as far as the constitution is concerned, is it a tripping wire where we have the envelope also? Uh, you can address it briefly and uh, add on no. also your thoughts as well. Just as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, I think wealth declaration uh, process was not meant to be academic. And uh, it is not in the Constitution, actually. It is not. The requirement of uh, consent of the person who has declared to, to be given for opening of the envelope is contained in a statute. Yes, that statute. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so, so I think that renders it useless. Uh, what we don't know clearly is what the state does with the information. Or it, does it just seal the envelope and keep it? Is it maybe Mary will tell us or John because they were in government mm. when the declarations are made? Are they analyzed? Does the state take measures towards understanding what is being declared, or is it just a form? A public officer signs it, puts it in an envelope, it is sealed, and that is it. Forever. Uh, from the perspective of uh, civil society, I think the purpose of uh, wealth declaration, as George had mentioned, was for purposes of ensuring that should there be disputes on uh, what this public officer owns or if the allegations of uh, impropriety on the part of the public officer, it becomes easy to determine how have you acquired your, your assets and properties. And, but uh, we don't know. We don't know whether the, the, what, what the wealth declaration process serves at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, John, you say that... Uh, yeah. The, the constitution is a tool Kenyans use to control the elite. What do you mean? <laughs> I think the point I was making is that there's an extent to which um, if you look at uh, the, the, uh, and the struggle that Kenyans have, have, have engaged in to change the constitution, to, to remove section 2A and to, to promulgate the constitution that mm -hmm. we have now in 2010. Yes. There's discussion now about um, uh, changing it again. Um, Yes, ultimately, 
uh, if you look at the demands that come from the people, if you read through uh, the the very extensive um, uh, comments that the Yash guy, uh, Professor Yash guy team got as they went around the country, getting Onanchi's comments on what they wanted in the constitution, it was very clear that one thing that Kenyans wanted to do was to manage what they felt was a very rapacious, small elite at the top of our society that is mismanaging and stealing their resources and also uh, treating them in a totally unaccountable manner. Uh, and one inch was saying, okay, let's have a constitution that protects us. It's almost as it's, it's, it's our shield and defender uh, from, from the elite. So yes, the, the constitution is in a sense uh, a, a tool for us to to, to manage and to protect ourselves from this uh, from this elite, but you know that was slightly tongue in cheek. Ultimately, it you know it, it you know the constitution says you know, mm. the people are sovereign, uh, and it's it's really the contract uh, between us as a society and how we want to live mm. um, that 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 is expressed in in that document, and that's why people put a lot of um, of, of truck into it. Mm -hmm. Yes, but for Nainchi, yes, we cry back to the constitution. People rush uh, to court, to the Supreme Court, etc., to to be able to to find some respite um, uh, from the excesses uh, of an elite that has run, run riot, uh, especially now. And I say especially now, uh, Debril, because um, uh, we're in an unprecedented situation uh, where Kenya is implementing essentially uh, an IMF. Uh, it's not des you know, designed by them, but it's an IMF template austerity program. We had climbed out of that by 2010. We have climbed back into this hole simply because of our profligacy and corruption. And it's one inch. It's, uh, you're paying for it, I'm paying for it, but only one inch. You know, the cost of paraffin, the cost of, 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 uh, of just food uh, and daily living is paying for this. And I think that's, that's, that's painful. And that causes the, this ngungunikaring uh, that you're hearing, this uh, disquiet uh, that you're hearing amongst uh, uh, one that, uh, that we've gone backwards. Yes, Kenya has moved forward tremendously. Uh, we're collecting a lot more in taxes. Yes, you can go in and get your passport, uh, you know, in hours. It used to take, you know, forever to, to, to get. And so, yes, Kenya has moved forward. But I think Kenyans have a right uh, to demand. And that, that's what makes us uh, a unique and dynamic uh, and thriving society. That we are always pushing ourselves. We mm -hmm. always want more. Uh, we're not satisfied. You know, we, Kenyans, you know, you know, President Moore used to say, uh, Kenya is uh, an island of stability in a sea, and you'd compare us to Somalia and other places. Uh, and I'd always say Kenyans don't compare themselves to failed states. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very sad if uh, we're going to have uh, leaders now who economically, due to real recklessness, uh, lead us in that kind of direction. Right. Let's say from Georgia, we are, there are no messiahs. We are our own messiahs. But do you think there is a collective angst amongst Kenyans? Uh, because uh, the sense right now is uh, a sense of despondency amongst the citizens, really, you know, that our leaders have failed us. Uh, we've thrown our hands in the air. Uh, let it be like, yeah, like it is right now. There's nothing much, to, much that we can do. We're actually controlled by the political elite in this country. So uh, how can we be our own messiahs when we do not have that particular grit and uh, you know the, the sheer uh, resilience to even go through uh, the fight? We feel like we actually backed on the wall right now. I think uh, it, it, we are coming from a place where, if you just take the last five years of the, these governments, they came to office, had huge promises for the country, we'll do this, we'll build uh, this number of uh, stadiums across the country and very many things. They had uh, uh, promises of, of, of glitter uh, for, for, for all of us, but that has not particularly materialized. But that has also not stopped them from promising us. Uh, they still make more promises and they, there's no acceptance, no, there's no um, overt acceptance on their part that the things that they promised have not been delivered on and the, the, the contrary is quite the case that there's been significant failure to uh, to achieve 
anything that is beneficial to, uh, in terms of the public interest. So that's the space we are in. Uh, so we're in a space where there has been failure, but that failure hasn't had political consequences um, for anybody. The, the people are still in charge, they're still promising more, and they're still taking us down a path that is going to hurt us. So, um, so either we believe them and postpone our own agency, postpone our own taking responsibility for ourselves, or we rise up now and say, this is our country, and we're going to come together and organize ourselves in a manner that we assert our own leadership for our own selves and determine for ourselves where we want to go as a country. So that is where I'm saying the people who had a messianic uh, entry into public office and, say, and promised us many things, haven't delivered on those things, okay. but there are no consequences to, to them. So do we wait until... Uh, when, do we, uh, when do we wait until uh, before we take action and take control of our own lives? Mm -hmm. George, and political consequences seen in elections, if you're going to have rule of law and order, and you're saying there are no political consequences, but political consequences are then in an election, whether you're an MCA, an MP, a president, a deputy, a party, you reap what you sow in the, in the elections, and I know that's another debate. So when you say that then you will organize yourselves to be able to demand or take control, what is that? Because for me, is to hold them accountable throughout that process and then, and every day, hap on it, take them onto account on every single thing they say that they will do and haven't done. And then at the end of those five years or two years, or whatever it is, you hold them responsible and, you know, by this consequence you say, bye-bye, I'm going to another party. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just wondering. I'm glad you raised that. Uh, it would be a nice thing to do if elections worked. The point is elections don't work in this country. Uh, let's, let's okay, just, your opinion. Let, yeah, yes. let, let's just talk about the last election, uh, 2017, uh, just last year, recent memory. So we go into this election, which is annulled by the Supreme Court. And like we've had uh, all grouses in relation to all the previous elections, but this one is actually annulled by the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court says there were illegalities and irregularities, and then it orders a fresh election. That fresh election is not materially better than the first election that was annulled because then violence and the disorder and uh, entropy just sets in in such a manner that the quality of management is significantly deteriorates. But the message being sent by the political leadership is that whatever you do, we'll always have our way. If you go to court, um, and, um, and and whatever the courts give you or whatever the courts tell you, we will not only not obey it, but we will also uh, scare everybody so hard, Msando and so on and so forth, into ensuring that we have our way. So elections as a mechanism for renewing society, as a mechanism for ensuring that uh, people, ordinary people have a way of expressing how they feel about how they've been governed, are not working at the moment and that is part of the problem that we have as a country mm -hmm. all right L let's see from uh from from some as well uh because uh, you, you say that uh, you th this particular movement is aiming at uh, to take back leadership and also to take back resources could we expound on this when we talk about taking back leadership and taking back resources what essentially do we mean uh, do we, do we, are we facing a country or are we in a country where there is a leadership crisis from uh, your own appraisement? I think it's taken a couple of months in formulating the 10 points. And as I had mentioned earlier on that this has been a mutation from uh, Kurayangu, Sautiangu, we the people. And it's becoming bigger because we are seeing even trade unions moving in and joining us. We are seeing faith-based groups. And we are starting on the premise of can we try to identify the problem. So when you look at uh, leadership as Kenyans, can we ask ourselves the question, do we have leadership that is satisfactory? Do we have leadership that uh, Kenyans can be proud of? We have seen mediocre leadership at very high levels as a result of the elections. Is this what we anticipated. Nairobi 
is a crucial and important uh, economic hub for this country. And we know how the governance systems in Nairobi operate today. Is this what we really expected? What is the role of the citizen? So when you talk about we need to assert a leadership, we need to have a candid conversation. What kind of leadership do we want in this country? Do you want criminals? Do you want to celebrate criminals? Yeah? When we talk about resources, for example, how are our resources being managed? Because these grievances and complaints are all over. Yeah? When policies are being formulated, are they uh, people-oriented policies? Or are they just economic policies because somebody is sitting calculating figures and saying the state will make this kind of billions without looking at the people? Does the state exist for the people or does it exist by itself? I think those are the critical questions. What is our sovereignty as a people? What is our role? And this is a conversation that seeks to empower the people first. Let us assert ourselves. Let us assert our rights so that with all these groupings, whether it's political elites or business community, at the end of the day, Kenya exists for the sake of these people, uh, the, the citizens. And uh, we'll be here for a short time. What are we living? Uh, our children, our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Will their lives be much more better? If we were to ask and pose that question, will their lives be much more better than today? I don't think so. So we need to have a candid conversation. What is leadership and integrity? Mm -hmm. What is the spirit in the Constitution? Okay. I hear you and I agree with you 100%. And I remember saying the same thing a couple of weeks ago. And I was challenged as to whether we ourselves as citizens actually take that participative ownership and responsibility to be part of that debate. And I was talking about Nairobi and complaining about this road and this and that. And somebody told me, you don't go to those meetings. You don't, you know, and they put in the newspapers. We don't go. We don't text our MCA. We don't, and he gave me examples of things that he has done. Seeing a road being done, it wasn't up to the whatever fee. He texted. They got the people to go. So I think the issue is how do you mobilize ourselves, we the people, to be part of each discussion and to go. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, then you'll be subject to capture of a few civil societies who also go and say what they want without getting the population to go. I always see those things in the newspaper. They're debating this budget, the day here, Kuala, or this place. Do people go? Very few go. So those with interest, if it's industry lobbies, they will write what they want. Association of Manufacturers, KEPSA, they will do this. We as our ordinary people, how do we take responsibility and know we are part of that process? And to me, mobilizing our citizenry, ourselves to know there's nobody who's going to build Kenya for you other than yourself. How do you physically participate at that individual level? That to me is a major problem. Yeah, right. Because there are some counties you hear, they're doing very well. You know, their governors are doing very well, and well, there are some where there's absolutely, you know, nothing going on. All right. Uh, even as we're preparing to uh, give our headline thoughts, <coughs> we'll come to you, Sam. Uh, maybe, George, you will tell us right now. Yes, we have this particular initiative. Uh, what are we aiming to achieve? Do we have any particular timelines? Or will it just be another initiative, a flash in the pan, taper off, then we'll have another initiative coming we don't, without even getting uh, the results of this, uh, actually, and having some of the high spots that we were actually gagging for? or really uh, fronting for? I think, uh, th uh, thank you very much for, for, for asking that question because then it takes us back to like the, the, central, the, the, the central discussion that uh, uh, was planned for this morning. So what we are planning to do is to uh, help citizens, to motivate citizens to organize themselves uh, to make concerted demands that improve their own lives. That's really it. And the way to do that would be to uh, help citizens come together in different parts of the country. If you go around the country, this country hurts a lot from very many aspects of failure. If you go to the northern half of the country, huge amounts of violence that is uh, perpetrated by different actors, some of them state actors, some of them um, local militia against uh, local populations. Uh, if, you, if you come into, into the cities, uh, the, the, the poorer neighborhoods, huge amounts of violence uh, uh, in, the, in the form of um, extrajudicial executions and so on and so forth. So the country has 
starts from very many different problems and people don't have something that organizes all these separated individualized struggles. So what we are trying to do through this movement is to bring a, a collective thread that organizes a different people and, uh, and their struggles into a commonality that has uh, a, a, a concerted demand that is capable of being noticed. So that's, a, so that's the first thing. The second thing is to organize them to realize that their problems are uh, related to how governance choices, how governance, the governance decisions are, are being made and have been made. And if those decisions are changed, uh, if, if the process is changed for making those decisions, that has a, an effect on, on, on their own individual uh, positions. And then if you have a critical mass, then make demands and take, uh, take matters into their own hands in terms of uh, uh, improving their own lives. So we, uh, the first part of, of, of this is informational. Uh, then uh, organizing people to base, first of all giving them information and using that information uh, once they have that information they will understand what their problems are they will also uh, uh, discuss the solutions and also uh, and come up with a pathway a, a roadmap to achieving those solutions okay. and, 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 uh, and because they will then be a critical mass they will make, be able to make demands Thank that you. yield what they want for themselves yeah. Johnny Gidongo, your closing remarks uh, briefly as you I, up. you know I couldn't agree more with uh, with what George has just has just said uh, but uh, you know if, if you look at the Kenya Twitter Kyle charter that, yes. that was read, read yesterday uh, one of the key objectives is also to, to protect our constitution a great deal of uh, struggle uh, has has you know, a lot of Kenyans have struggled a great deal to reach where we've reached mm -hmm. with this uh, very special constitution that we have as a country. And therefore it, it needs protection, mm -hmm. uh, especially key elements of it, like devolution. Mm -hmm. So this time, um, with this permutation of Kenya to Itakayo, perhaps some of the greatest energy might not actually be seen here in Nairobi but out in the counties. And yesterday, even though we were meeting in Nairobi for, for the event, many of the people who are, th who are there came from around the country. And some of the most energized mm -hmm. groups are in the counties, uh, directly involved in, in the governance choices that are impacting on their lives on a daily basis in, in, in their counties. And them being able to come together with colleagues from other counties and share experiences uh, and, and, and lessons is, ex is extremely important. Thank you. So that's another very important objective. Thank you. Mary, your closing remarks. Yes, I, I just got concerned when I heard George saying take matters into our own hands, citizens, and then sort of, uh, you know, decide the solutions. But then he went on to say on what they can do. So that makes me feel comfortable that these people are taking ownership and accountability to do something. And we're moving away from the Mulika Mwizi kind of approach. We're always pointing on what's happening without taking ownership and responsibility to demand what we are actually required. Right. So that makes me feel positive. Thank you. So finally, your closing remarks. And my, my only closing remarks are to the Kenyans. Those who think they are comfortable, it's good, it's okay. Those who think there are issues that uh, need a conversation because we have had this experience the launch yesterday was not just the first thing we did so for example when you talk to hawkers in Nairobi mm -hmm. you start from the premise do you have any issues mm -hmm. if they don't have any issues you tell them thank you very much if they have issues then you start processing those issues and you see what is their role what role can they take up what are their responsibilities and who else can come yes. in so we intend to proceed on this basis and uh, I tend to think that uh, participation, genuine public participation is key. When I say genuine, I also do not mean some of the public participation we have witnessed Thank you. from 2010. Thank you. And of course, Kenyans have issues. Just read one or two tweets as we're winding up. Uh, Abdallah Mudambo is saying the Kenya to Itakao is that which cares for the people, protects the dignity of all, and where all of us are able to realize our aspirations on an equal basis. Also, we have uh, David Gadura saying genuine democracy in Kenya and our politics, um, genuine democracy in Kenya and our politics not to interfere with the economy and above all maturity in our politics. Also, we do have uh, Karani Onsomo saying 
just inclusive healthier this is what they want also we do have uh, uh, Whitney Micheni saying transparency accountable and uncorrupt that is what they desire right thank you very much for your valued uh, company and also to our panelists this morning Sam uh, Mohochi who is the ICJ of uh, uh, I mean, he's the executive di director of ICJ, that is the International Com uh, Commission of Jurists. Also, thank you to Mary Mukindia. She is the CEO of CDI Africa and also uh, uh, executive coach. Thank you for coming through. Also, the executive director of Kenya Human Rights Commission, George Kigoro. Thank you for coming through. And also, the CEO of Inuka Kenya Trust. Thank you for coming through, uh, John Gidong as well. We really do appreciate and we hope Kenyans will run with this initiative to make sure that, yes, we have the Kenyan, uh, the deal Kenyan that we all aspire for. Thank you very much for your valid company. Living with us is up next.